Now we're back. We're live. It's the one o'clock clock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And we're talking today about American foreign policy with Russia and China and with Bob Gerrier and David Santoro, both of Pacific Forum, uh, which lives in, <clears throat> it lives around the world, but mostly it lives in Bishop Square. How do you like that? Uh, so welcome to the show, Bob. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Jay. Be here with you, Jay. Thanks. So let's first talk about uh, Pacific Forum. There are doings at Pacific Forum. Bob, can you talk about it? Sure. Well, um, first of all, you know, we, we've been around for 45 years. I, I think of us as kind of Hawaii's own think tank, private think tank, nonpartisan. Uh, and again, 45 years in the, in the business, so to speak. Um, I'm actually passing the baton come this summer, uh, late June, over to David Santoro, who's currently our, our vice president. And, uh, and director for nuclear policy programs. So looking forward to this very, uh, very seamless change and uh, I'm heading back to the East Coast to continue my, my third chapter now, uh, post-retirement from the Navy. Um, but I uh, love what we do and I uh, had an opportunity to really grow the, uh, the forum uh, this last three years. And I was particularly pleased that we were ranked um, uh, among the, the top think tanks globally uh, in, a, in a recent uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, Lauder Institute uh, Global Think Tank um, rankings. So very pleased with that. And, and uh, again, a small staff and um, we weathered COVID okay. Lots of virtual uh, uh, groups like this and looking forward to getting back on the road and meeting face to face. That's great, Bob. Thank you. It's, it's been great having you here and been great talking to you when we, we have on a couple of occasions and I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing. David, you have a, a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a rebuttal. I mean, uh, full agreement. I, um, you know, I, I, it's 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 a great organization. It's um, it's it, this is an organization I've been with since 2011. So it's been uh, nearly 10 years, end of 2011. Uh, so you know, we we we're doing a lot of work with a very small staff, and we're doing work that in, in many ways is a little different from most think tanks because a lot of what we do is convening dialogues and, and facilitating discussions on often very sensitive issues, security issues. Uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is we do also a lot of research, uh, which is really what think tank think <laughs> and, and do. But so we are, uh, I want to say, a do and a think tank. Uh, which makes us in many ways quite unique. Um, and we also do work that uh, um, focuses on the whole uh, Indo-Pacific. So we are not specialized in one particular area. We look at the entire region, which again is, is very unique among think tanks. They're good for you. It's important to have you here. <clears throat> it's important to have Pacific Forum among us. And uh, it, it sort of gives us a, a global consciousness that we might not otherwise have actually. And uh, I want to congratulate you on, on your uh, promotion, so to speak. Uh, I'm happy that uh, you, you got the job and I look forward to having uh, regular conversations with you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to, to take over from, from Bob. I, you know, actually, let me, let me thank him in public for all the work that he's done. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, I mean, it's, it's, um, going to be difficult to follow his steps uh, but I think Pacific Forum is is set for for growth uh, we're doing a lot we're doing a lot more than what we we were doing we've been doing and so I think you know the the, the future is bright yes I agree and um, you know for my thoughts here on the opening of our discussion uh, you know you look at the news and you look at the local public conversation and you you don't hear that much about uh, America's position in the world, geopolitical position. Um, and, you know, that's, that's tragic in its own way because, um, you know, we, we don't have the same influence that we used to have. And we, as uh, President Biden says, we got to regain that somehow. And it's a, it's a long haul to do that. It's a, a very important to the future of the country. And so um, I really appreciate people who enter that conversation, especially including Pacific Forum, and are willing, able to discuss these issues so that people here in Hawaii uh, know a little about it. <clears throat> and it's more than what they get on the six o'clock and 10 o'clock news. It really is, has to be much, much more. 
Anyway, Baba, our conversation today is about American foreign policy at this point in time with Russia and China. Let's start with Russia. You know, I say to myself, you know, we've been engaging with them perhaps in a more, more of an embrace, uh, that's not necessarily a good term, uh, for a long time. And we have, uh, you know, engaged back in the day of the czar and certainly through the 20th century. And a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, have come from Russia. They have emigrated from Russia and the satellite countries. And so perhaps we have a greater consciousness of Russia. Um, <clears throat> should we? Uh, what is going wrong with Vladimir Putin? Uh, why uh, have we such a contention with them? And uh, what would you advise the United States to do at this difficult moment? Well, I mean, I think just to, to, to kind of chart us through where we've been and where we're going with Russia, you know, the successor of the Soviet Union, right? Obviously, to, to kind of catch everyone up, obviously, Cold War, um, you know, crested, uh, ended uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the emergence of Russia, then as a successor state by in treaty law, by the way, uh, you know, really following all those responsibilities and major relationships. Uh, and then, what we've seen really is, is the head of that state, you know, taking them into a very authoritarian direction. Um, and in, in many ways, um, I think looking to confront the US uh, um, wherever it can uh, on, on areas of, uh, of, of foreign policy, of, of, of outcomes of international events. Um, we haven't seen too many situations where both Russia and the United States are on the same side. That's not to say that these don't exist. There are functional areas where we certainly have common ground. And hopefully we'll get to this, I think, a little bit later, because I think that is the way ahead. But you see in particular, some of the events in the Black Sea and the Crimea, which, which crossed red lines. I mean, in, in terms of, uh, of grabbing territory, uh, forcibly uh, you know, occupying areas, uh, the whole use of active measures, and, and uh, I guess, Again, another version of gray zone tactics, which I can talk about on the Chinese side. But but there's a there's this notion of a, of a struggle, a continuous, contentious atmosphere, uh, and uh, and this 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 pressure that's kind of moving back and forth, if you will, in our relationship. Um, so I mean that's writ large, uh, and but in particular the um, the use of force. Um, the use of coercive means uh, in in, uh, in in Europe and in, in the continental you know, area, um, this, this crosses a line, and and the U.S. can't just stay and stand by and watch that happen because it's contrary to the norms that we've developed, you know, collectively you know, post World War II norms. We always hear about seventy plus years of building on the ashes uh, of, of World War II and then building a world order, a collective world order. By the way, no one dictated this unilaterally that everyone stacked hands and agreed uh, on basic principles. And this is what we talk about when people talk about rule of law, norms, respecting international law. Quite frankly, they're all enshrined in the UN Charter. But it's not insignificant. And this has been eroding. And Russia has been an active participant in eroding this. So I think that's the source of the friction, uh, what to do about it and how to engage. I look forward to having that discussion here because the answer is not always military. I think often people resort to that and say, well, gosh, what's our military response? You know, you ask anyone in leadership positions um, uh, in the Department of Defense today and, and past, um, the military choice is, 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 your, is really your last resort. Uh, uh, it's this diplomacy. It's about you know, state leads and all of these relations and the logic and the strategy behind it. Uh, what the defense offers, of course, is deterrence. And it has this capability that you maintain and that's what gives strength, if you will, to your, your, uh, your policies that State Department leads. And looking forward to talking about all these aspects, but I, um, I wanna pause just to see uh, if, if, if you agree or not with that, that view. Sure, um, you know, let me <clears throat> go back to what Tony Blinken on Sunday night with, uh, uh, with the 60 Minutes. You know, one thing he, he made clear is that we, we're, not, you know, we're not gonna have a war with them. It's in nobody's interest to do that. And for that matter, we're not going to have a Cold War with them, um, but they have been attacking us. Um, they put bounties on the heads of our troops. Uh, they've been making strange moves, uh, not strange, but aggressive moves uh, all over their western and southern borders. Um, and they have attempted to control our elections, which is perhaps the most obnoxious of all. 
Um, and that's that's troublesome. So you have on the one hand, you want to you, you want to impose sanctions or otherwise get them to stop doing these negative adverse things to the United States. On the other hand, you don't want to take it so far that it gets to be, um, you know, a, a heightened sense of uh, aggression. Um, and, and that's a problem. And Tony Blinken was talking about how you, on the one hand, have a discussion about non-proliferation. And on the other hand, um, you you show them they, they can't get away with these things, including internal things like like uh, uh, Navalny. Um, so I'm I'm thinking this is a more complex uh, kind of uh, diplomacy for that country than we have ever had. It's not black. It's not white. And we have to trade off on both of those uh, considerations, both of those missions, if you will, uh, in everything we do. Um, but but query, how do you do that without showing too much weakness or too much strength? What do you think, David? Well, I mean, I think I think you 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 know you you're correct. I mean, it's 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 not going to be black and white. Um, it's going to have to be confrontational in some areas. In others, we're going to have to give cooperation a chance. I think the way forward is to try and compartmentalize the issues. And frankly, even at the heights of the of the Cold War, we've managed to do that. We we managed to have a very uh, adversarial relationship at all levels. And despite that, we managed to conclude arms control agreements. We managed to agree that preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction, uh, and, and in particular nuclear weapons, uh, was in the interest of uh, Washington and Moscow. And so how do we basically push back against what has been, uh, especially since 2014, a new a new relationship with Russia. Uh, so how do we how do we push back on the one hand and on the other hand manage to uh, say all right well those issues are issues that concerns both uh, and and we need to actually work together. And it seems to me that what we have seen over the past um, few months is an effort on on the part of Washington to to do this. The, um, the, the renewal, the, the extension of the so-called New START Treaty, which is really an arms control treaty, um, you know, is evidence that, yeah, okay, we can do arms control together. We're not gonna agree on, on much, but let's at least make sure that we can isolate the nuclear dimension in so far as possible, because this is the most dangerous aspect. I happen to think that there are a lot of other things that we can do together. But uh, it's going to be very difficult. And, and if we can at least, again, isolate the most dangerous components of, of, of the relationship, I'll be happy with, with it. You know, I, 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 I know a lot of people talk about the need to uh, get some U.S.-Russia and for that matter, U.S.-China stability. And to me, this is much, much too ambitious. I talk about stabilization. I say, let's try and, and move towards stability. Uh, let's try and take care of the worst aspects of competition in both relationships with Russia and with China. And if we can do that, then I'll be happy. Of course, it would be even better to have stable relationship uh, and ideally on terms favorable to the United States. But right now, let's take care of the, of the, of the again, the worst aspects. And if we do that, um, then then I'll, I'll, I'll sleep better. Yes, and uh, uh, we, we would all. So, Bob, one other thing comes to mind about Russia, and that is this. Um, Putin is a very powerful man, uh, despite the fact that he's a, a dictator. And um, he's, he's ensured himself uh, you know, to be an absolutist until, what, 2036, I think. Um, he's going to hang around, do his thing, and he's going to crush any opposition, going to crush any protest. And that's clear. He knows how to do that. Uh, at the same time, he knows how to he knows how to you know, do invasive things with American democracy. Um, and he knows that American democracy is, as the talk field said, tumultuous. Um, and because of that tumult, uh, every, every four years we have a, a, a turnover of power, sometimes, uh, sometimes more peaceful than other times. In this past uh, November election, it was not peaceful. It still isn't peaceful. Um, and um, other nations look at us as an example of... Uh, disorganized, fragmented, divided, weak, and they take advantage. So here's a guy who's, uh, you know, some people think he's quite pathological, but he's uh, the dictator in charge. 
Um, and he's uh, going to be there longer than any president would be there. Uh, how can we deal with him when he does not have our interest in mind and when he is going to be there longer than any president? Well, again, going back to, the, to your first um, point, what's different now than in the past? I, um, I, think, I think absolutely the, the, the degree of sophistication of how you think about security issues has grown. It's grown with technology because you have means to do things that you couldn't do before. So the realms you know, of, of the struggle, of the tension, of the friction that exists, uh, it goes well beyond the conventional arms and things you know, that, we, that we normally count. Uh, let's, let's call them the industrial age metrics, uh, metrics of how we think about power. And so those are all still there. In fact, they're there for a long time to come. We've built our defense establishment around them. But add to that these 21st century capabilities of cyber, uh, what you're now increasingly doing in space, which is growing rapidly. And these are now added to the deck, if you will, of things that can be done, and in many ways, much more powerful. And so I think you see the adaptability of, of, of the field of, of, of competition is spreads beyond the mere physical uh, and, uh, you know, again, traditional terms of, of use of force to areas that are now virtual, the manipulation of, of elections, the loss of trust. Think about the fundamentally how you really get at an adversary or someone that you're really competing with. And if you really want to do damage to them, you try to break down the trust that these, systems, these democratic systems are based on. And that's a very powerful thing to try to unwind. It's ethereal. It's, it's hard to grasp, right? Uh, and, and, and we're grappling with it. And I have confidence, actually, we're going to figure this out. We, we, we have to. It's, but it's part of the 21st century and how the struggle, the friction is playing out. So what you're seeing now, you know, I, I had the, the, the privilege to, to attend the uh, Indo-PACOM change of command just last Friday. Mm. And the Secretary of Defense, so Austin, was there speaking. And he talked about some, you know, he, he really did, did a wonderful job of recapping, you know, the, uh, the world we live in. And his comment was, you know, I just finished the last two decades of my life, you know, working, uh, you know, fighting, you know, the last of the old style wars, uh, re referring to Afghanistan and so forth. And he says, you know, we're in a new age now. We really need to think. We need to adapt and not kid ourselves or even be surprised at the level of competition that we're seeing and the use of these new technologies, information, um, misinformation, disinformation, cyber, and all these tools. So in the end, what you're hearing in policy statements, and I believe this is very correct and appropriate, you know, we need to moving forward in a world characterized by friction that's not gonna go away among great powers that are openly competing. But you look to cooperate wherever you can, right? I mean, you cooperate where you can. And David just talked about some of those areas and they're there. There are absolute areas of mutual interest. But at the same time, you're cognizant that you've got to compete wherever required and then confront where you must, where, where, where our own core values and red lines. And then in the end, the Defense Department's mission, of course, is to be ready when tasked to fight and win. So that's the whole spectrum. It's a continuum uh, of all the notes uh, on the keyboard you have to be able to play, <laughs> uh, right? And, and uh, to be compelling and deterrence is a big part of that. And, uh, and he mentioned the notion of integrated deterrence, that we need to move past this, the, you know, often many practitioners have thought about, well, there's strategic deterrence. This is only nuclear things. Oh, well, no, it's, it's more, it's, it's more uh, sophisticated than that. It's really a consumer. Yes, it is. But what, what lessons can we learn to apply to China? Because China is not the same kind of situation. Uh, how would you differentiate our um, you know, need to plan good foreign policy with, with Russia as with China? There's a difference, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, again, the Cold War is often uh, brought up as a, um, as a reference point. Big difference, of course, is there was, there was not a degree of economic integration that we see, of course, now with the U.S. and China, and Russia for that matter, but especially China. And you look at the capacity that China brings to the table in terms of population, uh, some resources, but, you know, but it's mostly about, it's about this massive uh, manpower and, and, and ability to build an economy rather quickly, with help, by the way, and under a, a, a post-World War II order that was conducive to their growth, which is an important point to remind others that criticize uh, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the narrative, perhaps, uh, that, that they're somehow trodden, trodden upon and, and, uh, and have been taken advantage oh. of. <laughs> well, it's hard to believe that these days. You know, we had a show, David, uh, last week um, about uh, One Belt, One Road. 
And, uh, you know, there are various corridors, quite a few various corridors uh, by land and by sea and also by the Arctic. And the one in the Arctic is, if not the one across Russia um, to Europe, um, they both assume and spring out of a kind of uh, axis between Russia and China. How real is that? Um, is that, is that a, a, a true long-term alliance or are they just sort of mm, fair weather friends? You know, um, about 15 years ago, uh, a, a former policy, US policy makers, maker told me the Chinese and Russian economies are incompatible. We shouldn't worry about them forming, certainly not an alliance, but even any, any form of cooperation that will, um, you know, basically create trouble for the United States and its allies. I think this is still true to in many ways. And we heard, uh, I think a few weeks ago, um, the Russian uh, foreign minister very clearly say that he would not conclude an alliance with the Chinese. That said, since the early 1990s, the cooperation between the Russians and the Chinese has never stopped increasing. And over the past 10 years in particular, what we're seeing or what we've seen is growing cooperation in, in the security area, uh, more than in the you know, diplomatic, in diplomatic forums or in, in economic and so on and so forth. We see cooperation, for instance, the, Russian, the Russians are helping the Chinese develop early warning systems. Um, and so I'm sure they don't like each other. And I've heard particularly in Russia, uh, you know, not nice words about the Chinese, but they agree when it comes to confronting the United States. And they both see the United States as, uh, you know, a competitor, an adversary, um, whatever wor word you want to use, but they agree on this. And therefore, it might be an axis of convenience, but it's um, an axis nonetheless. And from Washington's perspective, I think, unfortunately, this is something that we need to worry about. So how, do, you know, going to the question I was asking uh, Bob, too, um, we have to deal differently with them. We have, you know, I mean, that's that's a, the better part of human relations. That everybody is different and you have to deal differently. So to the extent we have one mm, approach that Tony Blinken expressed um, to deal with Russia, what, what about dealing with China? That's another, another kettle of fish, isn't it? How do we deal with them? So, you know, many people will, have been talking about basically allying with Russia to confront China. That's not going to work uh, for the reasons I've talked about and also because, you know, simply the Russians are not interested. How do we deal with China? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand China better. Uh, I think that the Secretary of Defense was right when he characterized China as the facing threat, quote unquote, uh, of the United States. And we basically have to make better priorities. You know, from my perspective, getting out of Afghanistan is actually a good move. Um, now, that said, doing less somewhere doesn't mean that we will automatically do more elsewhere. Uh, but I think that um, basically prioritizing China is something that the US government as a whole needs, needs to do. That doesn't mean necessarily uh, launching a cold war against against uh, China, but it means taking China seriously because it has more than just military growing military power. It's it's got power across the board, and this is something that we we frankly not used to. Even during the Cold War, the Soviet Union the Soviet Union was much much weaker econo economically, and so we need to take China seriously. And um, you know, the former ambassador to Russia. Uh, talked about uh, the fact that with Russia, it's no longer a cold war, it's a hot peace. And I think, <laughs> uh, I think frankly, it's the same thing with, with, with China. We, you know, it's not going to be a cold war. It's going to be, we're heading for trouble, uh, but it's, 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 it's big trouble because, you know, China, China is big. Um, that said, again, there are areas where we can cooperate. I mean, I know right now it's not very popular to say that, but I actually think that we need to talk about crisis management. We should talk about climate change. We should talk about nonproliferation because 
basically these issues are not issues that the United States or any other country for that matter can address alone. And so we distrust the Chinese, they distrust us, but we have to find a, a way to work with them, however frustrating it, it, it might be. You know, one of the uh, troublesome things uh, about uh, the challenge to Tony Blinken and, uh, and Joe Biden is that when we tell them do something, and by the way, our, our uh, tariffs are still in place. The tariffs that uh, Donald Trump put in, you know, over a period of years uh, during his administration are still in place. There's been no rolling back of those tariffs in the Biden administration, and no plan to roll them back. Um, I guess for reasons that are pretty sophisticated. Um, in any event, uh, the, what gets in the way is in the meeting that Tony Blinken had with the Chinese, his Chinese counterpart, uh, he said, you know, you're doing some things over there that we really can't agree with. You know, Xinjiang, human rights, what you're doing in Hong Kong, um, you know, and, you, and your style about taking over the South China, all that stuff. This is a problem for us. Um, and, you know, will you cut it out? And the response from his counterpart was, don't tell us what to do. You know, you got you the last ones to talk about racial prejudice. You're the last ones to talk about fragmentation. You're the last ones to talk about our efforts to, quote, retrain people who are not following the system. Because, in fact, you know, you guys are in bad shape. And so we can't take advice from you. Now, this undermines, you know, our negotiating position, doesn't it? I mean, if I may, I, I, most, most definitely. But I mean, I, I categorically, you know, deny that narrative, which is a typical Chinese narrative that, that picks at small issues and then takes them or conflates them, number one, or then takes them way out of context. So in every single case of the things that we're having a problem with what China is doing, it's where there are gross violations of international norms. And so the, the, the normal quick response is, well, this is our personal business. We've claimed this area is now an internal matter because they've, you know, they've declared. However, it doesn't change the facts that, that it is contrary to international norms. Um, and, and, and this goes also for um, uh, you know, how they're treating people and ethnic groups, um, the deprivation of, uh, of, of, of liberties yeah, and, and uh, incarceration and the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, and so, so going back to how you deal with China, um, this is a large country with significant capabilities that has to be taken extremely seriously, just as David mentioned. And so to do that, you have to be consistent, you have to be coherent in your approach, and it has to be fully integrated, meaning all in. So it's, it's not just whole of government getting all the agencies and departments aligned, it's also whole of nation. And then go beyond that, don't stop there, it's whole of allies partners and like-minded. Because in the end, what we're up against here, and part of this friction that's really enduring, is it's not just episodic small things about, a, about an island dispute or island building uh, or, uh, or claiming the uh, territories or, or uh, other such conduct. Uh, it's about a rejection of an international order that was built collectively. And this makes it global business. So a typical Chinese response will be, well, no, this is my internal because I've said so. And we said, well, no, that's not the case because it affects all of us and it goes beyond the region. And in fact, these are international norms. They're not, not even regional norms. They're bigger than that. So these are important. And in order to enforce that or to show or give the weight of that argument, you need the power of allies, partners, like-minded. And so again, the rest of this narrative, and, and it's really pretty well articulated in the, the term free and open Indo-Pacific, and that's a really good narrative, by the way. There's nothing objectionable in that. There's no territory grabs in there for the US. These are shared values. It's eminently reasonable. And it's a very powerful thing. And I'd add lastly that it's, you know, again, the counter narrative would be, oh, you're trying to contain us. And it's no, it's more about advocacy for those things that we all collectively, the world, hold dear and work together to build. Come join us, come be a part of that. It can evolve but it needs to be all of us and not done through coercion. That's the narrative. And the coherence of that message is the mission of the State Department. So you know, to, to kind of cut to the chase, what do we need to do better? What do we need to improve upon? It, it's the coherence of that message uh, uh, coming through uh, loud and clear. You know, and this is, you know, democracies are messy. You know, we're a carnival of sorts, but that's also a source of power because it makes us less brittle 
were messy from the get-go. <laughs> An authoritarian uh, uh, organization, certainly they have coherence built in. So a very sharp message, right? It's very consistent, uh, and, but it's not unbeatable because often it can be brittle and it's an overreach. It can be proven wrong and then it collapses. But uh, again, thoughts on the approach. I, I think I think your point about uh, you know developing or redeveloping alliances is, is is really important, David. Isn't it so that the key to dealing with both Russia and China is to develop or redevelop alliances with multiple nations and create multi multilateral um, experiences for the world uh, to bring the world together, but then to be, you know, the, the good guy uh, for everybody. And if we can do that, we're way ahead. Now, the thing about uh, so far, China has ignored, um, you know, uh, global norms. Uh, look at the South China Sea and that that that, that lawsuit in, in the in the Hague, which it lost and then ignored. And Russia, you know, is ignoring all the norms. Uh, in, in Ukraine and so forth. Um, so it seems to me that um, the key here is to reestablish, and we, we lost some ground here during uh, the last administration, to reestablish our relationships with the EU and everyone, um, to be more active in the United Nations, to be more active in United Nations uh, affiliates, um, and, and be the guy who who created the, the new world order after World War II, who set or participated in developing this consensus that we have enjoyed for all these years. Uh, but how do you do that? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, my, my reference point is uh, Putin's speech in, I think, 2014, when he said, new rules or a world without rules. So it was very clear that, you know, either you change the system or, uh, it's going to be basically whatever we decide it's going to be. Um, and so I think the way to do that is exactly what you, what you said, is that we, we need a coalition of allies, partners, and we need to invest a lot more in existing multilateral organizations and, and possibly also develop new ones uh, to try and sort of defend the system that certainly has benefited us, but also many others. And so if we can do that, then you know, we can, I think, establish some form of uh, return to normalcy uh, when it comes to international order. And, and this is true for Russia, this is true for China. Um, where I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a little difficult is to do so with China, because again, China is a much bigger power and a number of countries are um, you know, very dependent on the Chinese economy and therefore reluctant to engage uh, or to, to take on China uh, by, by you know, being a little bit more, by doing more pushback. But I don't think it's impossible. I think that it's fairly reasonable to expect, uh, again, as, as Bob mentioned, respect for a number of rules and norms because we can't really function uh, in a system of 193 countries if we don't have common rules. Yeah. One last question, Bob, and it's, it's a hard one. I'm, I'm warning you now. Okay, during the past four years, um, the, the government, uh, such as it is, you know, at least two out of the, well, I'd say three out of the three branches, um, didn't fully recognize the importance of, of having good foreign policy and good international relations. And we lost ground. Okay, now, now Joe Biden is hopefully trying to, you know, mend that. But it seems to me that Congress has to go along, as it has to go along with other positive you know initiatives that he's trying to you know adopt for the country and it would seem to me that although the president and the secretary of state have a lot of authority here and a lot of opportunity here um, you ultimately have to have the congress and especially the senate behind you because if you don't do that if they you know just hunker down and and say you know we don't agree with the president on anything um that leaves us with a problem on the on foreign policy, on foreign relations. So how do we fix that? Well, I think, I mean, yeah, that's a really <laughs> softball question. Thanks. Jay. So, uh, no, I, you know, in the end, you know, it's very, it goes back, you know, to how I thought about my job here at Pacific Forum. And I'm not being cute with that answer. We're, we're nonpartisan now. We, we declare ourselves as that because I really did believe deep down that that, that, that this, this notion of international security, national security really transcends politics. Of course, I'm not naive that how you choose 
to uh, to pursue different paths takes on political you know, implications, of course. But the larger consensus of a direction, a strategy, is a very is a, is a can be if it's written properly a unifying theme. But let me add that amongst all the tumult, you know, tumult if you will, the last several years, um, there's actually been a remarkable consensus among the parties uh, in our external foreign policy. Not 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 everywhere but a general sense of agreement on, on our situation with China and Russia in terms of this notion of great power competition and the need to really lean into this uh, as an entire country, as a whole of nation. And you're right, it's a whole of nation. It's, it's, it's beyond whole of government, all three branches, it's whole of nation, allies and partners, as I mentioned, and the need for coherence. And I think that transcends politics. And so that's my fundamentally, it's in all of our interests. Not every decision, not every comment, not every press conference need be a political event uh, or a, or a, or a zero-sum exchange where, where someone's scoring a point and has to lose. There are elements, you know, um, you know, politics, you know, stops at the edge of the border. You know, that's an ideal, uh, hard to attain precisely, but it is an ideal that doesn't that makes a lot of sense in the end. It's in our it's in our national interest. Absolutely, amen to that. Okay, well, why don't we give you the last word, David? Um, you can you can add to what Bob was talking about. You can say anything you want uh, in your moment of elevation here. <laughs> I, I, you know, I um, let me put it this way. I, I okay. So so here here goes. Um, I have a book out this this month, and so I'm going to make a shameless plug for it, where I talk about the the need to actually engage. China on the nuclear aspect of, of, of things. And we need to actually think of China as a global power and consider other nations and how we can shape the US-China nuclear relationship by taking into account other powers, be it North Korea, um, South Asia, India in particular, as well as US allies. And so I guess my, my final word is, uh, this is a good book. Okay, I don't know if you have it with you, but if you do, maybe you could read us uh, a few sentences from it so we can feel the, the strength of your prose. I, you know, unfortunately haven't received it yet, but it's, it's on its way, so it will be out very soon. Okay, well, where can we find it? We need to read up on this. It's, uh, it's published by Lynn Reiner, and I was told that the official publication date was May 3rd, but again, it, I haven't received it but uh, I'm told it's out since Monday. It's okay, out. well, I hope you'll come back on our show and uh, talk about that book and uh, we can drill down on, on the points you make there and, uh, and, and the, the steps to follow in, in this very difficult time of reasserting ourselves on the global stage. And Bob, all the best to you, but uh, I know that they have internet on the East Coast. I know this for a moral certainty. And I know we can catch you on Zoom just exactly in the same way. So I hope you'll let us do that. I'd be delighted. I'll be delighted to Jay. Thanks for the opportunity to chat today and talk about some pretty important topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob Durier and David uh, uh, Santoro. Thank you for Pacific Forum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha. Thank you, Jay.